Okay, could I ask those leaving the Chamber and indeed the Public Gallery uh, to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible? And the next item of business is a Members' Business Debate on Motion 4464. Could I ask those leaving the Public Gallery please to do so as quietly as possible as business is uh, resuming? The next item of business uh, is the Members' Business Debate on Motion 4464 in the name of Rhoda Grant on NHS staff recruitment and retention. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I would invite members who wish to participate to press the Request to Speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I will put an R in the chat function if they are joining us remotely. And I call on Rhoda Grant to open the debate for around seven minutes. Ms. Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to thank the members who signed my motion allowing this debate to take place. And I would also like to thank all those individuals and organisations that have provided briefings, far too many to name, and that shows the level of interest. Staffing issues are common throughout the NHS. Indeed, last weekend we saw the RCN survey of nurses point out that 90 per cent of nurses said that their last shift had been understaffed. Currently, across Scotland, there are 6,209 nursing and midwifery posts vacant. In NHS Highland, this is 296, 8 per cent of all nursing and midwifery posts in the board area. When staff shortages are issues elsewhere in Scotland, in the Highlands we bear the brunt because it is easier for people to change their careers without impacting on their families when they live in the central belt. In the north, we need to attract people not only to move themselves, but also to uproot their whole family, and therefore it is a lot harder for us to recruit. Add to that the shortage of affordable housing, local services and public transport. Therefore, it is no surprise that in NHS Highland waiting times are amongst the longest in Scotland. They are attempting to recruit from all over the world, and it is not for the want of trying that they find themselves desperately short-staffed. For Tree Hospital, Urgent Care Unit is closed more often than it is open. Home care and care, care homes are desperately short-staffed as well. The new Broadford Hospital, which was opened by the Cabinet Secretary only weeks ago, cannot be fully utilised because of a lack of staff. Dentistry in Murray is also so dire that NHS Grampian are requiring dentists in Aberdeen to step in and help. Dunbar Hospital Minor Injuries Unit only recently reopened as there were staffing challenges uh, due to staff being moved to support the COVID response. Staff are also totally burnt out by the pandemic. Some are off sick with stress, others with mental health issues, and some are leaving the profession altogether or taking early retirement. Turning to the specifics around maternity care, since the Caithness General's maternity service was downgraded, any births with likely complications have been sent, usually by road to Inverness, over 100 miles away. A petitioner this week made the point that that is like a mother in Edinburgh travelling to Newcastle for maternity care. At the time of the downgrade of Caithness Maternity Unit, clinicians in Inverness expressed concern with regard to staffing in Inverness and whether they would cope with the additional numbers. And the local community in Caithness were obviously concerned due to the long distance women needed to travel to access these services. Risk assessments were carried out on the service in Caithness due to lack of paediatric support. But nobody has risk assessed the journey from Caithness to Rigmore Hospital in Inverness. And the same situation is now... Yes, I give way. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am very grateful to the member for giving way. I absolutely share her sentiments about the distance, the unacceptable distance that expected mothers are expected to travel from uh, Caithness to Ragmore. She will recognise that a lot of work has gone into a similar situation in Murray and a solution largely found, but no such solution or government time has been devoted to the Caithness situation. Does not she agree that that is a crying shame? Rhoda Grant. In, indeed, I do agree, and I have written repeatedly to the Cabinet Secretary to ask him to visit uh, Caith people in Caithness and speak to the community there, and I understand he is going to do that, which is extremely welcome. The, the situation, uh, as the member said, in Dr Grayson Elgin, which is part of NHS Grampian, is the same. And again, 
the plan is to reroute complex cases to Ragmore Hospital in Inverness. But this time, the clinicians, management, and indeed the community know that this can't happen without additional staffing and investment at Ragmore. Despite this, it appears a fait accompli. We read in the news of the weekend about two cases, one in Murray and one in the south of Scotland, where babies were born by the roadside. These were births that were deemed too complex to be supported in the local community midwife-led unit. Yet it is somehow safer for these babies to be born by the roadside without any support. I really don't believe that. The risk created by this system to mothers and babies is enormous, especially in the winter months. And it puts added pressure on um, paramedics, which is also unacceptable. I beg the Cabinet Secretary to take this risk on board because it should not take a death to prove it. We need to act. We need to train more staff in all disciplines, but crucially in maternity, obstetrics and paediatrics. In the Highlands and Islands, we have our own wonderful world-renowned university, a new university at the cutting edge of delivering education and research differently. The university used to run a fast-track midwifery course, and this course was open to nurses, was held close to home and allowed them to enhance their training into midwifery. The course was building steadily and would have been in place to provide the maternity workforce of the future, albeit draw drawing from an already stretched nursing workforce. However, as so often happens, it was centralised to Napier University in Edinburgh. The difficulty this creates is what I alluded to in the opening. People are reluctant to uproot their families to, to further their careers. Therefore, to grow our own workforce, we need to provide that training close to home. Evidence given by NHS Education for Scotland highlighted that midwives are more likely to remain in the area that they were trained. I'm sure this goes for other disciplines. The situation also adds costs to our health boards. Employing a locum or bank staff is much more expensive than employing a full-time member of staff. The use of locums also creates issues for the patients as well, because there is very little continuity for them. There are also issues in the way we train our professionals. We focus on team working within specialities. What we need in rural areas are generalists able to turn their hands to a number of conditions, and they need to be able to work with very little support. We currently recognise a depth of knowledge through career progression and salary, yet those with a breadth of knowledge find their skills unrecognised, both professionally and financially. While I have used maternity services to base those points upon, the same is true in other disciplines. Mental health services in Caithness are at breaking point with tragic consequences. GPs are handing back their practices to health boards. We have some of the longest waiting lists in Scotland. The situation is untenable. I urge the Cabinet Secretary to act. Any other further delays will lead to a loss of life. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Grant. Uh, we now move to the open debate. I call first Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Sandra Gulhani for around four minutes. Uh, Ms. Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to be able to take part in this important debate today and congratulate Rhoda Grant on securing it. I want to start off by agreeing with Rhoda Grant that there are many complex challenges in our NHS, and in particular with NHS recruitment and retention here in Scotland as well as across the rest of the UK. The COVID-19 pandemic systematically changed the way we do health care in Scotland, and there is no doubt that the pandemic exacerbated pre-existing challenges in health and social care. It caused staff to change working patterns and practices, adapting to enormous challenges and to hugely demanding environments. Of course, this is going to have an impact on recruitment and retention. That is self-evident. However, what is important is what we do to address these issues, bearing in mind the, co the combined impact of the pandemic and of Brexit, which it must be accepted has caused massive barriers to the recruitment of staff to our health service. The challenges cited in Rhoda Grant's motion are not confined to just the Highlands and Islands. We have our own challenges in Aberdeen Donside and across the whole NHS Grampian. 
Presiding officer, continued workforce supply challenges alongside high levels of vacancies, particular in, particularly in medical specialities, nursing and midwifery, and recent increased vacancies with allied health professions, bring an over-reliance on supplementary staffing across our NHS, including across Aberdeen. The current available supply of staff is insufficient to meet the ever-increasing demands of our health boards. However, there are opportunities to look to alternative supply pathways. Participation in further international recruitment initiatives using the networks of current NHS staff, continued development roles, links with further education, apprenticeship programmes and a review of all agency placements will be key to making the changes necessary to address supply challenges. So, presiding officer, how is this achieved, particularly for NHS Grampian? The Scottish Government must continue to support the Board to extend the workforce market to a wider range of potential applicants. We must utilise current supply pathways while seeking to widen the, these routes through the innovative approaches. Implement an easy and intuitive process that encourages individuals to apply for posts and improve candidates' experiences of recruitment. This must be an approach which invests in marketing the brand of NHS Grampian, offering a range of jobs and career opportunities. Create a service model that is service-based and influenced by the diverse resource, capacity and skills of the existing and future workforce. This model must be applied in a way that uses skills, generates effective teams and is efficient, creating a workforce fit for purpose. And finally, in order to ensure retention, the Board must be supported to implement the staff governance standards within a culture that values and listens to staff and their contributions, one which ensures that the current workforce is offered appropriate development opportunities. I ask the Cabinet Secretary today for a commitment that the Board will be supported with these aims and that all action will be taken to ensure the sufficient staffing of our valued NHS, which is so important to many constituents across Donside. Presiding Officer, I have heard lots of complaints about an ageing workforce being an issue facing our NHS. However, when I touched base with NHS Grampian ahead of this debate, I learned that an ageing workforce is recognised as an opportunity in, have, in having highly experienced staff, and I pay tribute to the Board for exploring new and innovative ways of working and opportunities for staff who wish to remain working beyond their retirement age. The Board are fully supporting the ageing workforce and in many cases are providing opportunities for older staff to move into mentoring and senior roles, as well as into career advancement. advancement. Presiding officer, in closing, I again welcome this debate. The steps the Scottish Government are taking to support NHS recruitment and retention, and I reiterate my asks of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Mbar. I now call on Sandra Gohani to be followed by Jackie Bailey for, again for around four minutes. Dr. Gohani. Thank you. NHS staff have played a vital role in, and an enduring role during the COVID pandemic. Like all my colleagues in this Parliament, I would like to reiterate my thanks for their efforts and continued resilience as we begin rebuilding from the pandemic. Jackie Dunbar just spoke there of an ageing workforce, and actually the worry is that ageing workforce retires with no one to come in behind them. That's the worry. It's not their age. I share Rhoda Grant's concerns that the SNP government has yet to adequately support NHS staff in Scotland. We are faced with serious recruitment and retention problems, and not only in the Highlands and Islands. Many of the issues we see today are as the result of failed workforce planning. The SB Government are not treating long COVID with the urgency it requires. The numbers of those suffering for more than a year has doubled in just six months. Across Scotland, it's estimated we have over 150,000 people suffering from long COVID. Of these, 64,000 have been experiencing symptoms for more than a year. This is increasing the strain on services and on NHS staff. The recent workforce plan was insufficient and lacked ambition. The number of unfulfilled registered nursing posts in NHS Scotland continues to grow, increasing pressure on already overworked and exhausted 
nursing staff. The latest stats on the nursing workforce published two days ago show that 9.5% of registered nurse posts in Scotland were vacant at the 31st of March 2022. That's a record high. The rate equates to 4,605 registered nursing posts unfilled compared to 4,500 by the end of 2021. The overall number of vacant nursing and midwifery posts is 6,209 as of 31st of March, up from 4,495 at the same date in 2021, an increase of over 38% in 12 months. Non-COVID sickness absence in the whole NHS workforce has also increased to 5.7%, up from 4.7% on the 31st of March 2021, increasing the pressure on the whole service. Colin Pullman, the Royal College of Nursing Scotland Interim Director, says nurses deserve more than to turn up to work shift after shift and to be expected to deal with significantly increased demand with fewer and fewer nursing staff. And I couldn't agree with him any more. Immediate action is required to support staff retention. To address long-term recruitment issues, we would take and need to take a comprehensive approach towards workforce planning for the whole of NHS Scotland, in every profession and at every level. Furthermore, we would remove the cap on funded places for frontline medical students to increase the number of home domiciled students because we know they are more likely to continue working in NHS Scotland. Presiding officer, successive SNP health secretaries have simply failed to adequately treat work workforce planning in our NHS, and the devastating results are clear for all of us to see. Thank you, Dr. Gulhai. I now call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton again around four minutes. Ms. Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me join with others across the Chamber in thanking NHS and social care staff for their hard work and congratulate Rhoda Grant for securing that debate. Um, she makes a powerful case for training NHS staff as close to home as possible and specifically for training to be provided at the University of the Highlands and Islands. And I support her in that call. But I want to talk in more general terms about staff recruitment and retention. And the comment from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow summed it up for me when they said there are not enough staff to meet the needs of our patients and went on to say the challenges of workforce shortages are not new. They existed long before the pandemic and have deteriorated since. On Tuesday, NHS workforce statistics were published. 9.5% of registered nurse posts are vacant. That is a record high. The overall number of nursing and midwifery posts is 6,209 vacancies, up by 38% in the last 12 months alone. The day before that, the Royal College of Nursing published a frankly shocking survey that told us that eight out of 10 nurses had patient safety concerns whilst working on their last shift because they were so understaffed. Earlier this year, six out of 10 were actively considering leaving their job. At the start of the pandemic, it was three out of 10. The key reasons for leaving, including feeling undervalued, under pressure at work, unsafe staffing levels, and low pay. 40% are working beyond their contracted hours, and 67% are too busy to provide the level of care they would like. The Royal College of Midwives also surveyed their members. 70% of them are considering leaving the service. And like the RCN, their members cited safety of their patients due to the lack of staffing being a very real problem. Faced with all this pressure, it is little wonder that staff are leaving the NHS. And it's not just nurses. One in five consultants are leaving the NHS well before retirement. They're citing burnout as one of the key reasons. There is a shortage of allied health professionals. There is a shortage of GPs too. In fact, with a GP, their workload is enormous and there are simply not enough of them to cope with rising demand. And whilst I think we would all welcome the government's plan for 800 more GPs, I reflect on the words of Dr Andrew Buist from the BMA that training an extra 800 is not the same as getting them into practices where they are needed to improve access to patients. Getting workforce planning right is critical, but that will take time. So the retention of existing staff must be an urgent priority for the government. 
We need to care for them so that they can continue to care for us. But this extends beyond just their welfare, important though that is. We need to pay them better, to recognise and reward their hard work, and that is in both health and social care. We also know that the NHS lacks flexibility. Rather than letting 40 years of experience walk out the door, why not see if you can retain their knowledge and skills on a part-time basis? And above all, let's implement the Health and Care Staffing Act of 2019 that everybody in this parliament voted for unanimously to ensure that there are safe staffing levels. It's been on the statute book for three years and nothing has happened. Now, the Cabinet Secretary says he will publish a timetable by the end of June, and that is very welcome. But a timetable that is vague, that pushes implementation years down the line, will simply be unacceptable. There is a huge crisis that has been unfolding for years, and the Cabinet Secretary is giving the appearance of being asleep at the wheel. I hope he wakes up before it's too late. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I now call Alex Cole-Hamilton to be followed by Carol Mochan again for around four minutes. Mr. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking uh, Rhoda Grant for securing parliamentary time for this important debate? And can I also, Presiding Officer, associate myself with her remarks around the difficulties faced by expectant mothers travelling from R uh, Caithness to Ragmore to deliver? And under nobody's estimation, is it safer for a baby with complex needs to be born by the side of a road than it is in the care of a hospital near to their home, which is what we, wish, we should all aspire to see for their families. I will to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Alice Cole Hamilton to, to give way? And I don't disagree actually with his uh, comment a moment ago. Will he recognise, though, that the decisions taken around Caithness, of course, were themselves because of a very, very tragic case, and actually patient safety was put at the heart of that decision when it was taken a number of years ago? Alex Cole Hamilton, give you the time back. I do recognise that. It was taken a number of years ago. Things have moved on. We need to listen to the community. We need to listen to clinicians and, and actually make things safer for mothers to be able to deliver um, in, their babies closer to their home in Caithness. Um, can I also give thanks to the Royal College of Nursing, who, alongside others, have worked tirelessly to provide the country with the information that we are largely debating today that illuminates the current crisis in nursing. And it is a crisis. It is, it is, unfortunately, it is unfortunate that this information is such bleak reading after we've been talking about this for what feels like years. Um, released this week, as we've heard, the last shift survey report has revealed that awful statistic that 90 per cent of nurses or respondents believe that the number of nursing staff on the last shift they did was not sufficient to properly meet patients' needs. Not only is this dangerous for patients, it puts an inordinate amount of stress on staff themselves, as the report highlights, who they, and they sacrifice their own well-being to deliver care that their patients' needs. And as a result, 63% of staff in Scotland surveyed feel exhausted to the point of negativity by the end of that shift. I'd like to highlight that this is almost 10% higher than the average UK number. And the daily reality, Deputy Presiding Officer, is dire. It's quickly becoming, in fact, untenable. Describing their experience in the recent RCN report, one nurse said, and I quote, one day I walked onto my shift and I was on my own in the entire floor. I can't describe how I felt at the end of that shift, emotionally and physically. They go on, something should be done about the staff shortages and fast. Otherwise, nurses will be forced to leave one by one and the few remaining will die of stress and burnout. That reality is particularly stark in remote and island communities. Presiding officer, I think those words speak for themselves. And the reality is that we have passed as a parliament legislation that should not allow them to happen. In the safe staffing legislation we have passed, we have recognised as a parliament that we can't allow shifts to proceed in those unsafe ways, and yet still they do. And the Cabinet Secretary, I welcome the final announcement of a long overdue timetable for its implementation, but we've been waiting three years. And I would reiterate the point I often make, that it is not just about headcount. We need to be sure that every shift has the right mix of skills and experience to deliver patient care safely. As that nurse described, these unbearable working conditions mean more and more staff are lost to the profession. They will be forced to give up the job that they love, and that potentially puts those off who are considering entering the profession in the first place. This will lead inexorably to fewer staff, putting more pressure on current staff, worsening working conditions like never before. It's a vicious cycle and one that we need to break. This is why the Liberal Democrats have called for the establishment of an NHS staff assembly to learn from the lived experience of staff. And I was heartened that yesterday 
um, Hamza Yusuf agreed to look seriously at that. It's also why we have repeatedly called as a party for a burnout prevention strategy, which would implement mental health help for frontline staff supporting them in their job. This plan has been voted down successively and routinely dismissed by this government, including in the same exchange when uh, Humza Yusuf referred to this idea as just being a piece of paper. The problem is that despite the Health Secretary telling us repeatedly about the money being invested into staff welfare, they are yet to produce their piece of paper on how this money will actually be spent towards supporting NHS staff. A burnout prevention strategy is exactly what these people need. And the motion today references training NHS in uh, all areas of Scotland, not just in the central belt. Uh, this is something that the Liberal Democrats are fully supportive of. This can't be a postcode lottery. Widespread training programmes are an important step in re producing widespread care. This is vital to ensuring our nation's health. I'd like to end, Deputy Presiding Officer, you've been very good to me, on the words of Pat Cullen, the RHCN's Chief Executive. To those from government listening to my words, we have had enough. The patients and those we care for have had enough. It's long overdue that this government not only listens but acts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gold Hamilton. I'm always good to everybody. Um, Carol Mochen to be followed by Brian Whittle for around four minutes. Ms. Mochen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Rhoda Grant also for bringing this important motion to the Chamber. I would like to start by echoing the points made by Rhoda Grant regarding the difficulties of recruitment in rural areas in our own area of NHS Highland. Um, the, 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 the recruitment is a major concern across the NHS, but is definitely heightened in rural areas. As Rhoda Grant mentioned, the RCN advised before today's debate that in NHS Highland, 224 registered nurse posts are vacant, which is nearly one in 10 posts. Um, and this is reflected in other rural areas. Deputy Presiding Officer, that is a significant cause for concern and one that this government ought to take very, very serious and act upon. This is an ongoing issue debated many times in this chamber and raised repeatedly by nursing trade unions. I say it regularly in the chamber, but the Scottish Government cannot take time to pat itself on the back while vacancies remain high across the country, and as vacancies remain high, staff remain under pressure and services continue to be strained. This Government must consider carefully the ways in which recruitment can be improved, and that must include the training of NHS staff close to home. Covering a rural, rural constituency myself, I do hear this time and time again, many of the points made by Rhoda Grant earlier in this debate. We have first-class university and college facilities across Scotland, and it is important that training programmes are rolled out in our rural areas, one such as in Highlands. Um, in my own area, in the borders, for example, to ensure those who wish to enter the healthcare profession can train and then hopefully take up posts close to home. Moreover, in our efforts to ensure care is, com is community-based and available locally, we must also recruit more in key areas, and that includes in mental health and learning disabilities, as was referenced in the RCN uh, briefing, to ensure that such services have the staff to meet the demand and that the services can be delivered close to those who rely on them. Um, this helps both patients and staff. Both can benefit from facilities close to home, and this is so important in rural areas. Indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer, we know that recruitment and retention are both very closely linked, has been, has been mentioned across the Chamber in this debate. Just last month, I highlighted at First Minister's question discussions with Unison Trade Union that workplace pressures in NHS borders had less staff, staff to report to the union issues, including staffing levels that are dangerous for both patients and staff, and that staff are not receiving proper rest breaks. This is unacceptable, and I know the government have acknowledged this, um, and they say they are going to address this. But on these benches, we have to keep pushing to ensure that this staff stay, safe staff, staffing legislation is enacted, um, and, that the, and that the government is taking this uh, seriously. Um, these points have been made in the chamber before, and we must start to enact some of this work. It is a workforce that, that gives us so much to the community um, and to our country, but it often feels that it gets so little back. And so is it any wonder, therefore, that vacancies remain so high and that staff feel under so much pressure? 
Presiding officer, if we want to recruit and then retain a skilled workforce serving every part of our country, including rural areas, then we must start by alleviating some of the barriers to recruitment of students. And we must, we must address workplace police pressures uh, currently facing staff, making the healthcare setting an appealing one to work in. Um, in concluding, presiding officer, it is clear in Rhoda Grant's motion today that in the Highlands we have some uh, have seen the removal of a key training programme from local university being moved to a large city in Edinburgh. And it is also clear from the contributions and from trade unions and NHS workforce uh, briefings that the current workforce pressures are significant and putting strain on the ability to deliver the service patients deserve. This highlights two very clear issues, both in recruitment and in retention. Yet there are two, two issues that can be fixed by bring, bringing training programmes closer to home. And um, for rural areas, this means that we would have some valued NHS staff close to home that could provide these services. Um, and it's an, a significant point that should be followed up by the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms. Mochan. I now call on Brian Whittle to be followed uh, by Michael Mara again for four minutes, uh, around four minutes, Mr. Whittle. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I add my congratulations to Rhoda Grant uh, for bringing this debate to the Chamber? I think she would uh, uh, recognise as well uh, we are, uh, this is not the first time we have discussed such, such issues in this Chamber over the, the last couple of uh, sessions. Um, I want to start with, with back when uh, a, a, a conversation I had with my daughter while she was at university uh, studying, uh, studying law. She came in and decided uh, and said to me that she actually wanted to change to midwifery. And there's a switch for you. So she's gone from studying law to studying midwifery. And we looked, we looked at uh, uh, that possibility. And at the time, there were 10 more applications uh, for, uh, 10 applications for each individual place available to study midwifery at, at college. And, you know, I, I you know, ra raised this with her. She still wanted to do it, and, and, and on she went, and she, she actually got one of those places. Um, and that actually, I look, I, I, and having looked at that, I looked at other, uh, other uh, medical uh, professions, nurses and physios, and there's four times as many applications uh, for the number of places that are available. My colleague uh, uh, Sandesh Gohani talked about the cap on medical students from uh, domiciles in Scotland, and, and, and there is no lack of applications for them. Um, it was mentioned, I think, earlier on that uh, in the last uh, in the last term it was highlighted that we had a shortfall of 864 uh, GPs in in, uh, in Scotland, and the government responded by suggesting they would train a further 800 GPs over the next decade. That failed to take into account, of course, turnover of GPs. In fact, the uh, Audit Scotland report suggested that in that 10 years' time, we will still leave a shortfall of 600 GPs. I had uh, a case very early on in uh, my political career uh, with a constituent who, who unfortunately uh, lost, a, lost a child in childbirth at Cross House, and they had an inordinately high number of baby deaths at that hospital, we managed to get an HIS report uh, um, into that, and it discovered that we were 24 staff short in the neonatal unit. I have to say, my, my daughter now works in that, that, that neonatal unit, but when she first qualified uh, as, as a, a midwife, she could not get a job in Scotland and actually had to travel to Preston and do three 12-hour shifts uh, and then get the train back up again. And, I mean, she now Unfortunately, it works within the Scottish National Health Service. So, where is the workforce plan? And I think one of the things I would, I would suggest, especially around the, the, the lack of GPs, is, uh, and, and the importance of having domicile, uh, domicile students, uh, Scottish domicile students, is where they tend to work relates to the postcode they put on their UCAS form. And I think that is, is highlighted in Rhoda Grant's motion. And one of the things we're discussing today is, is, is recruitment and retention. And I think that, quite frankly, is our own way around. The first thing we should be doing is making sure we retain the staff we have. It's, it's to trying to fill up a bucket with a hole in it. Two, we, we need to create an environment where our medical staff want to work. We need to start to take cognizance, more cognizance of reports of bullying. We need to make sure there's advancement. We need to make sure that the, the hours that they work uh, 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 and the shifts that they work 
are much more in, in, in uh, keeping with a, 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 balanced, a balanced life. I remember talking five years ago about making sure there's, there's hot meals of an, of an evening and an evening shift where it wasn't happening before. And we, more importantly these days is ensure things like mental health support is available for all, uh, for all our staff. Because if we want to invest, which is my passion, in, 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 in health service further upstream in that preventative agenda, then we need a, a workforce that will be able to deliver that. And one of the first things I ever said in here is, is that, that to, to improve the health of our nation, it must start with looking after those who look after us. So when we discuss recruitment and retention, or retention and recruitment, let's make sure that what we actually mean by that is by looking after the health of, of those who look after us. And that would go an awful long way to, to starting to deal with the issues in Rhoda Grant's motion. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. I now call on Michael Manor for around four minutes, Mr Manor. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I, I too offer my thanks to my colleague Rhoda Grant for bringing uh, this debate to the Chamber and for the, highlighting the needs of her constituents in terms of not just workforce planning but the particular challenges that per pertain to uh, the population of the Highlands in terms of the dispersed population and the special uh, accommodation of that that must be made if we are to ensure that our uh, National Health Service can provide for them appropriately. I want to talk, um, uh, unsurprisingly, in this debate about um, my, uh, my own constituents and the challenges that they face in some of the same regards, workforce planning uh, in particular. Um, but the major shortfalls in oncology consultants uh, at NHS Tayside, um, and particularly for breast cancer uh, patients. Uh, many of the issues that have been highlighted so far uh, pertaining to workforce planning um, are an impact on that situation. I know that the Cabinet Secretary uh, recognises that, that these are challenges um, across the whole of Scotland. The 2020 Scotland Workforce Census demonstrated that an estimate of around 18 per cent of consultant clinical oncologists are forecast to retire by 2025. And my home city has borne much of the brunt of that. Uh, but how many patients, I ask, will have to have their cancer treatment compromised before we see a change in response to that on a truly systemic level? Um, so I confirmed to the uh, Cabinet Secretary this morning in general questions uh, that the, uh, the final breast cancer oncologist has left employment at Nine Wells Hospital in the last couple of weeks. Um, and of course, there is a considerable uh, history to this issue. Um, we do need a comprehensive workforce plan, and the, the recruitment is clearly part of the response. But I am com increasingly coming to the conclusion that it is now clear that a recruitment process alone will not deal with this issue. Uh, when a prospective consultant sees an advert, they will research the centre, Google the record, speak to colleagues um, in the international community that are involved in these services. And what we will have found in Dundee is a record of conflict between clinical staff and management, a seriously flawed Health Improvement Scotland report, and reports of a culture of bullying as referred to by members and exchanges in Parliament this very day. Um, Sandish Gulhani raised that issue. I'll take his point. Sandish Gulhani. Thank you. Um, does Michael Mara agree with me that this secret report needs to be made public and urge the Cabinet Secretary to intervene? intervene? Michael Mara. I, I would certainly agree that I think that all documents pertaining to this, uh, to this situation should be put in the public domain. The, the, the report that uh, the member refers to in terms of the um, report by the Royal College of Physicians of London, I believe, is a report commissioned in 2019 and is shrouded in some issues regarding conflicts of interest and uh, arising from uh, some of the members involved in the production of the report. It seems to uh, have been, uh, been shelved, and although the, the, the reasoning for that has never been entirely clear and open. Um, I think that what we really need on this issue is full transparency and openness around uh, all of the publications. And I would say there is also a further document I would like to see the Cabinet Secretary um, uh, produce, and, uh, which is the right of a reply response to the Health Improvement Scotland report submitted by the clinicians in Dundee um, in response to that report. That should be provided as well. Um, and it, only when we actually deal with this underlying issue are we going to deal with the fact that we cannot meet the recruitment requirements around this area of specialism in Dundee. And the board of NHS Tayside must now step up at long last and perform their legal functions in this matter to challenge rigorously in their own code of conduct the executive officers who are presiding over a chronic situation which will only be helped by full openness and real honesty on all parties. And so these questions were asked to the First Minister by Labour colleagues in February 2021, 16 months ago now. 
and we saw more of a year of obfuscation and denial from the Scottish Government. As late as November 2021, the Deputy First Minister appeared in the Chamber in complete denial, saying it, to raise the issues was a disservice to the women of Tayside. On 27 January this year, I advised the Chamber and seemingly the Cabinet Secretary for Health that there had been further resignations tendered from the service, and as I say today, I inform the Chamber that there are now no breast cancer oncology specialists in Dundee. And the Cabinet Secretary for Health gave assurances that day that he and other ministerial colleagues have been deeply involved in the issue. I am afraid that is now becoming as much of a concern as a reassurance. There is a fundamental breakdown of trust. And only full transparency will restore it and the services that the women of Tayside and Dundee need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mara. I now invite Hamza Yusuf to respond to the debate, Cabinet Secretary, for around seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I thank uh, Rhoda Grant for bringing this uh, important uh, members' debate to the Parliament. I thank members who have contributed uh, from across uh, the country and across the political spectrum, uh, although I may not agree with uh, the characterisation of all of their points, uh, I certainly do think the substantial points that have been made uh, in relation to, to recruitment, but also uh, retention uh, and staff and workforce planning, I think these are important points. I'm going to try to touch upon some of the general, general points, but I think I would do a disservice uh, to this debate if I didn't touch upon some of the key themes and key points related to NHS Highland, which Rosa Grant uh, has uh, 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 raised in this uh, chamber too. Uh, but of course, other members are correct. The, the issues that are, are pertaining to, to NHS Highland, they are not unique to NHS Highland. Uh, they are replicated often in rural, remote and island uh, communities uh, as well. So I will address some of those more general points too. Um, in terms of uh, the, the issues raised by uh, Rhoda Grant, she is right. Um, I have been, uh, as she knows, recently to NHS Highland on, on a couple of occasions over the last uh, few weeks to open uh, two new hospitals uh, in NHS Highland. I'm pleased uh, of that Scottish Government investment. But she is absolutely correct that uh, on both occasions, both when I visited uh, Badenoch in Strath Bay, but also when I visited Broadford Hospital uh, in Skye, the issues of workforce uh, recruitment and retention were raised with me uh, repeatedly by staff uh, there. Uh, Rhoda Grant is also correct, and other colleagues such as uh, Jackie Dunbar uh, touched upon this point too, uh, that it is not just about uh, a job offer. It is about housing. Uh, we know that. It is about transport links. It is about education, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and again, I will try to touch upon some of those uh, points where I can. Uh, workforce uh, and, and recruitment of workforce, of course, uh, is key, and I'll touch upon retention issues uh, soon. I recognise that there are uh, vacancies in particular staff cohorts which are far too high. Uh, so a number of colleagues have raised the uh, workforce stats that have recently been published uh, around nursing vacancies. Agreed. Uh, they're not going to get a... Uh, a, a difference of opinion for me uh, suggesting that uh, the, the, uh, those, those uh, vacancies are acceptable. But I also want to put on record uh, and robustly defend the action that we are taking. We are uh, doing our best to recruit in an extremely challenging and competitive uh, market at the moment, recruit as many uh, uh, nurses and qualified nurses and midwives uh, as we possibly can. But overall, our workforce uh, record in this government uh, is one that I am very, very proud of. Since 2006, we know there has been an almost 30,000 uh, increase in whole-time equivalent staff uh, right across uh, the NHS. Uh, I, will take, uh, I will take an intervention. Brian Whittle. very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. But he also says it is not just about recruiting current staff, but about training staff and the training numbers. And wouldn't a long-term strategy be, in fact, if we had done it five, six, seven years ago, we would not be in this situation just now? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, training programmes uh, underway, and particularly training programmes uh, and incentive, incentivisation programmes for rural health boards that help to attract people and keep them there. But I will come to the retention point in more detail. I was uh, about to say that we have a proud record of uh, recruitment in the NHS, as I say, from 2006. Uh, over, oh, sorry, almost 30,000 uh, whole-time equivalents uh, recruited to our NHS. Uh, when I look at NHS Highland in particular, because I know that's an area of, of key interest in this debate, uh, we've seen that the workforce is up by 33.6%. By uh, uh, um, that, that, that's higher, actually, than the growth across NHS Scotland, um, uh, average growth across NHS Scotland. And in terms of medical and dental consultants, that increase has been uh, over uh, 70%. And if I look at statistics, uh, uh, more, more recent than since December 2019, uh, obviously just pre-pandemic, uh, the increase in the workforce in the NHS Highland has been 7.8%. But uh, going to the point I was just making a moment ago in response to Brian Whittle, uh, we are doing what we can to ensure that we can recruit and retain, particularly to rural uh, health boards. A golden hello, a payment for uh, GPs new to rural areas. 
uh, and via a primary care rural fund to support established GPs uh, with our Rediscover the Joy programme, which we're hoping to extend uh, to other health board uh, areas uh, too. Um, in, in terms of uh, some of the, the challenges raised by uh, Rhoda Gant more uh, specifically, uh, I take the point she's made about Keith Ness, and I think Alex Cole Hamilton made those points uh, too. I have, uh, she uh, graciously noted, uh, agreed to meet with the campaigners uh, in Keith Ness, uh, and I will do that, uh, of course, this summer. I'll ensure that uh, MSPs are, of course, invited to any of those uh, discussions too. Uh, what I would say, uh, and, and, and give an absolute assurance, and I do hope members will take this at face value, that it is the safety of both mothers uh, and their unborn children which is of paramount importance to all of us. And I, and I agree with their point that giving birth in a lay-by is not what any of us would want for uh, our own uh, children. Um, and we would not want our own family members to be in that position. Of course, that gives way to Rhoda Grant. Rhoda Grant. I think we all agree that giving birth in a lay-by is unsafe. But I would be really grateful if the Cabinet Secretary would commit to doing a risk assessment on those journey times in emergency situations or indeed in routine situations. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I will certainly explore how we can do that uh, in a way that is, is absolutely meaningful. Uh, the point I was, I was just about to make was the point that uh, I made in response or, or in, in intervention to Alex Cole Hamilton, which we do have to bear in mind that there was a really tragic case um, and of course the review done into that tragic case which said that death could have been avoidable uh, and therefore the really difficult decisions around Keith Ness uh, were, were, were taken. But I, I take Alex Cole Hamilton's point in response to that which was that was a number of years ago and uh, things uh, uh, should have uh, moved on uh, from there. And in terms of um, education and training which I think is a really important point raised by almost every member uh, who has spoken and, and, and mentioned, uh, from a very personal uh, perspective, from, from, from Brian Whittle. Uh, we are really keen, of course, to, to try to ensure that uh, we can train the workforce in remote and rural and island uh, health boards uh, where uh, possible. I think that's a really important uh, endeavour for, for, for us here in government and, uh, of course, members across the chamber. We'll be aware of the Scott Gem uh, programme, the, the uh, Scotland's first uh, four-year graduate entry uh, medicine programme is hosted by the universities of uh, St Andrew and Dundee uh, from 55 students in 2018 to 70 students uh, this year. And of course, particular re relevance to NHS Highland uh, is the Scott Gem programme includes periods of time uh, living and studying in NHS Highland. And we know, and I've heard from remote and rural uh, Highland health boards time and time again, if we get them to live here, get them to train here or study here, then we've got a much better chance of retaining them uh, as well. Um, in terms of uh, the, the points made uh, by uh, uh, Jackie Dunbar around a more coordinated approach across rural health, but I think that's a point really well made. That's a point I can absolutely commit to. She asked me to commit to uh, supporting uh, Grampian uh, in terms of their staffing and recruitment. Uh, but I do have to say our recruitment activity at times can, quite frankly, be a bit ad hoc. And having a more coordinated approach, particularly across, I think, uh, remote and rural health boards, is something uh, I am very, very keen uh, to do as well. In terms of midwifery training, which again is a key part of the motion uh, that uh, Rhoda Grant uh, has raised uh, today, uh, she was uh, obviously uh, she is concerned about um, uh, the, the, the discontinuation of the pilot uh, at UHI. She will be aware of the review that took place uh, into that pilot and into uh, midwifery uh, workforce education. Uh, that took place by NAIS, and, and I think the report was published uh, in March of uh, last year. Um, uh, and she, 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 can, she can come back to me if she's got any specific points uh, on that. Uh, but it should be said that, uh, of course, it did say that uh, uh, the, the current suppliers that we have, uh, the current institutions that are providing that training, uh, that, that educational opportunity, uh, they, they should continue. Uh, and that's why in, in January of this year, uh, Edinburgh Napier University welcomed students from across Scotland uh, to undertake uh, the new shortened midwifery programme. And in just 20 months, students will qualify while continuing to work in their home regions, including, of course, uh, Northern Scotland's uh, health boards. To in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, I've outlined we are exploring every possible avenue to improve health and social care by investing in those people uh, that, uh, that mean so much to us and the staff that care for us. They are the people uh, we have clapped for, we have applauded, and that is why we will invest in them, in their pay, in their terms, in their conditions. But let me also finally say that we will do everything we possibly can to work with our remote and rural health boards, including NHS Highland, to see how we can support them in recruiting and retaining staff uh, for the future. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m.